Okay, so we've brought up to this point in about uh, the 12th century. Now the meat of today's lecture is going to happen in the first 20 minutes. And then we'll look at examples um, and how the idea gets more entrenched and spreads to other countries uh, throughout the time. Uh, but I want to review a little bit where we are, um, especially vis-a-vis -vis Platonic um, thinking in Christianity. Now remember that soon uh, after Christ leaves the earth, we have the art of late antiquity. We have a dominant thinking at the time of Platonic philosophy, um, where there is value in a world beyond. Plato believed in a world of ideals, um, and everything we see on this earth, any truth we access, is because we recognize it, that we saw it earlier. Um, so this world is a knockoff of that world of ideals, a corrupt version of that world of ideals. Um, but truth is, is gained in a world beyond. Um, this idea merges with Christianity because it feels a little bit like the story of Christianity where you have a Garden of Eden um, and then Adam and Eve eat the fruit and we've fallen into this corrupt world and we recognize things, but truth is really to be obtained beyond. Um, this idea um, manifests itself a little differently. We talked about it first in the Byzantine Emperor, Empire um, where you have Christ that is this very distant character um, not of this corrupt earth, but somewhere occupying this golden light-filled realm, uh, synonymous with light. Um, and uh, we see a Christ that looks a little frightening, a little scary. The body proportions don't always line up. Um, now, as part of this idea, um, we have Christ who is distant, but he's kind of become this God of light because... Um, Christianity in the Byzantine world is surrounded by different religions that have gods of light. Christ has become a god of light. Um, Platonic theory is manifest differently in the Western world, um, but we see it also in Romanesque, where we often that Christ over the tympanum that's so important as you enter into that church, that's that key teaching moment to an illiterate populace. Um, you're going to see Christ... Uh, as judge of the world, most often as they're trying to scare people into being good. And a similar um, value of, of proportion that don't quite line up and don't make sense. But again, this is a good thing, uh, especially those body forms, as we see sculpture becoming a more important dominant part of Romanesque art, are coming straight out of the illuminated manuscripts. That's the holy spot. And so we're going to see these forms of Christ and these bodies that fit together coming straight out of the illuminated manuscripts in a style that's developed of this tug and pull um, between Germanic and, and um, more classical style, um, but a unique manuscript style, um, none of which is based in this naturalistic world, which is a good thing because it feels more like that world beyond. Um, now there is going to be a shift uh, that happens. Now remember, Justinian, when he was in charge of the Byzantine world, um, is seeking to establish one god, one empire, one religion, and actively killing anyone who is not uh, a part of that religion. Well, the Greeks weren't part of that religion, and so part of his campaign is going to be against uh, any Greek learning, any libraries that exist that he can find, he'll burn down and destroy any of these writings of, of, of the Greeks because they are heathens. The reason we have any Greek learning uh, to us today um, is because of Islam. In about 600 AD, um, we see Muhammad, uh, who's an Ill illiterate man who goes up into the mountainside um, and speaks to an angel. And the angel tells him to write. And he says, I'm illiterate. I don't know how to write. And he says, nevertheless, write. And so Muhammad starts writing. Uh, and he receives from that angel the Quran. Um, and so the Quran is is um, only the Quran in um, Arabic, because that is how the angel gave it to Muhammad. If it's translated into a different language, you're not reading the Quran. You're reading a translation of the Quran. Um, but writing as its basis in within Islam is, is really important. Um, all of their art finds expression in writing. Um, because they believed in, in not creating graven images. They take very seriously Moses' injunction. Um, the calligraphy becomes their art form and how they express themselves. Um, so while uh, 
Eastern Europe and Western Europe are in the middle of the Dark Ages. Um, Islam is what preserves all the writings of Greek philosophers. They're having this wonderful um, rebirth and renaissance, this golden age of Islam, um, where they're doing scientific experiments and figuring out different principles of math. Um, and so they save all of Greek and Roman learning um, for the rest of the world. So here we have Islam. It's now this powerhouse in the center of learning. Um, and after Muhammad dies, the other caliphs will um, embark on a convert or conquer campaign. Now remember, um, because Islam often gets a bad name as a violent uh, faction, that Christianity is in the middle of a convert or conquer campaign as well. Um, and so it doesn't seem quite um, so dramatic within uh, that context. So they move from Arabia. They start converting and conquering. I wish this map had a little north coast of Africa for us because um, they start moving along the north coast of Africa. Um, and they spread and spread and spread. And from the north coast of Africa to Portugal, which we see there, it's just a hop, skip, and a jump. So they move across the uh, north coast of Africa into Portugal, and that's what you see on the map, these Muslim dominions. Um, and they'll move in Portugal and into Spain um, and, and make important inroads there. Um, they bring with them the writings of Aristotle. Uh, and as these storehouses of the Renaissance, these writings of Aristotle are going to have dramatically change what goes on in Western Europe. So there are three major effects to the Muslims coming into Western Europe and bringing with them the writings of Aristotle. The first major effect is that um, these writings will combine with growing urban centers uh, to spawn new learning and study, particularly in Paris. Between 1180 and 1223, um, the king at the time, Philip II, is going to build up Paris, build walls, pave the streets, build the Palace of the Louvre, um, and the University of Paris will become the premier place to study at this time. We see the founding of universities. Uh, and at these universities, Aristotelian reason dominates. Now remember, Aristotle, as opposed to Plato, believes that the chair is a chair because I sit on it. Um, that there is value in experience and learning about the world by through observation. Um, and so that's what happens at these universities. That uh, they're going to seek to confirm scriptural truths through thought and reason, as opposed to just supernatural explanations. So that's the first thing. So we're going to have new urban centers and the foundations of universities where Aristotelian reason is going to dominate. The second major effect uh, of these Muslim dominions entering into Western Europe and bringing with them the writings of Aristotle is that we are going to see value in the world and in the ability to learn truth and worldly experience. And this is going to revalue the world that has been devalued for centuries now. And as a result, we're going to see an increase in naturalism and human experience that hasn't been important in centuries. Um, so keep on to that. Revaluing the naturalistic world is number two. And number three, as a result of revaluing this naturalistic world, we're going to seek um, or see a softening influence on the church at this time. Now remember, we have God who is a judge. In this um, Trinitarian view of, of God established in the Council of Nicaea, you have one God, and this God most often takes the form of a judge. But now we're not terrible, corrupt people because we live in the world. We're people having a mortal experience where sometimes life is hard. And what we need is understanding, not fear. We need an advocate before our judge. Um, it can't be Christ. Christ is the judge. But we need someone who can advocate, who can explain what it's like to experience pain in this life. Well, that's going to be Mary. She's going to rise up and become this fourth 
member of the of the Godhead a little bit, fourth member of the Trinity. And she's going to attain a huge, huge role and is deified. She's the one who understands. She had to sacrifice her son. Um, and she gets what it's like to experience pain and hardship in this world. Um, and, and this is really when the cult of Mary or Marianism gets established. Um, the vast majority of cathedrals built at this time are Notre Dame. That's what Notre Dame means is Our Lady. Um, so it's dedicated to Our Lady or to the Virgin. Now we call Notre Dame of Paris is, is the one that's most commonly called Notre Dame. And the rest are just called Chartres, Amiens, Rouen. Uh, but officially their names are Notre Dame de Chartres, uh, Notre Dame de Amiens, Notre, Notre Dame de Rouen. Um, they are all dedicated to the Virgin Mary at this time. That's one indication of how important she becomes uh, in this era. Um, what is really interesting is we're going to see women uh, have a few more um, niceties afforded to them that haven't been uh, afforded in the past. Uh, for example, this is the age of chivalry. This is when all the King Arthur tells get canonized. Uh, we have Lancelot who's going to go out and die for the love of a woman. Um, that's going to happen as a result to Marianism. Rising up and we see the, the relative um, role of women within a community um, become a little more important. So there's our three effects of um Islam saving the writings of Aristotle, entering into Western Europe, and bringing these writings of Aristotle with them. We're going to see a dramatic worldview change. First, by the establishment of universities. Second, by revaluing the naturalistic world. And third, a huge softening influence on the ch of the church um, and how we see the world uh, and the rise of Marianism being an offshoot of that. Okay, Another big important story. So that's one big important introduction, but let's come here to the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis. Saint-Denis was an existing church that was the royal church of the monastery. This was a church where the French monarchs were buried. Um, at the time, uh, the Capet family uh, was the family who was in charge, and they're trying to build a powerful kingdom centered here around Europe. Um, Abbot Suger, um, Suger is spelled S-U-G-E-R, he was uh, head of the, he's an abbot, so he's head of the church. He was the right-hand man of the monarchy. He serves as regent when Louis VII goes on the Second Crusade. Um, he kept the king and the queen married for a long time. Um, and so while King Louis is off fighting in the Crusades, Abbot Suger decides that the royal church needs to be renovated. Um, but it's now this new era where Aristotelian reasoning is dominating. And so he says... I should probably study. Let's figure something out as I, as I head into this uh, renovation. He does his research. He goes to the Royal Library of France. This Royal Library that was compiled by Charlemagne centuries ago. Remember, Charlemagne at Aachen invites all the best thinkers from all over the world. and keeps all those ideas and makes this Royal Library. And so in that Royal Library are the writings of one Pseudo-Dionysus. Now remember him? He is the thinker um, from Byzantine Empire at the same time Hagia Sophia is being uh, developed who says light comes from the good. Light is the visual image of God. And so here is Suger doing his research, comes across his writing and he says, that is it. Light is the visual image of God. We need to get some of that light into our buildings. We need, um, he's just thrilled by this symbolism of light and this potential of bringing a visual image of Christ into the building. Um, and so he wants to find, he doesn't just want light in the building though. He wants magic light, this visual image of God light in his building. So he tries to think and comes up a way to get magic light in his building. He calls it Lux Nova. Lux meaning light, L-U-X. Nova meaning new, N-O-V-A. And the idea he comes up with is stained glass. Now again, if you don't stain the glass, you get a lot more light in the building. 
but it's magic light, right? It comes through, the light filters through, fills the interior with this colored light like a prism. Um, and it feels like we have the visual image of God. Beyond that, it becomes a new way to teach people stories of the Bible. We have sculpture all around the exterior. We can use these tiny pieces of glass to continue telling the stories of the Bible. So we have our three-dimensional Bible in the buildings. Now, all the innovations he comes up with, the whole purpose of them is to open up the wall so we can fill it with stained glass. You can see this a little bit here. The first thing he does is points the arches. Now, we looked at Romanesque. We've seen pointed arches before, but now he's going to bring these technologies together in a new way to open up the walls and fill them with glass. Now, you can see here, it's a lot more stable if we have, you can see a groin vault is what we're looking at here. On the left, we see our Roman arch. There's our barrel vault, crossing vault on the other side, and we get kind of this dome on top. Um, and that's going to be the most stable uh, way to build it. But instead, he points the arch like you see on the right. And with that pointed arch, um, it is not as stable. We're receiving more of that weight up on the top, but he can open up more of the wall, use less masonry, um, and get it down to its skeletal remains, all the bare bones we need to hold up that building so that we can fill in the space we've opened up with stained glass. Um, the other thing he's going to do is rib those arches. Can you see on this on the right? You can see how that thick extra edge that he puts on it. Um, and again, we've seen this before during Romanesque art. But now that we're pointing those arches, we need to give them a little extra oomph, a little extra mass in order to support uh, that ceiling and hold it up. So we're going to point those arches. We're going to rib them. Um, in and, and make really slender columns, which you can kind of see here as well. You've got these skinny columns. All of this so we can we can get down to the skeletal remains of the building, open up more of that wall, uh, and, and fill this together. What's new is the goal, to lighten the building, the lightness, the transparency, the thinness of the parts, which allow the structure to open up. Now, in order to integrate all these complex elements, we're going to see a new profession arise, the rise of the architect or the doctor of stones, um, because we have to think in a rather complicated way in order to support uh, that building up there on the top. So what we were looking at before, this is the ambulatory of Saint-Denis. Uh, Saint-Denis, as the abbot Suger um, rebuilt it, um, no longer remains. A lot of it fell down and burned to the ground uh, in a fire. Um, but what we do have remaining is this ambulatory, uh, which is what we're looking at, the part that you walk around the altar, amble around the altar, um, so we can see uh, what his original plan was, at least in the size. Um, he also is going to restore the west facade with two towers. He takes, like, San Etienne, that um, William the Conqueror's building with that strong, resounding west work on the front of the building, that west facade with two towers. Um, and he's going to put one of those on the front of uh, Saint-Denis. Uh, Saint uh, and he also puts in a large central rose window. Now, a rose window is great because all of these buildings um, faced east. So as it sunsets, it's going to filter in through that. Let me show you what the rose window looks like. So this is at Chartres. But do you see that circle on the right that's uh, separated the parts? At sunset, the light's going to head through that building, and it's going to bathe the entire nave uh, in this colored light. And so we know at Saint-Denis, he had a large central rose window, um, a west facade, and then he has Jean statues. Um, uh, that had portals of Old Testament kings and queens and prophets attached to the columns. So we don't have that facade anymore because of the fire, but we can see its influence on other cathedrals. This is Chartres, which is a city outside Paris. Um, it also suffered from a fire, so you can't see all of it. One of my favorite things about these cathedrals is when the fire happened, they didn't try to restore it originally. Um, they restored it to whatever style was new at the time. So that's why you have two different looking uh, towers, one's earlier and later, and they just rebuilt it in, uh, uh, in the, new, the new style. 
Um, the lower parts, however, are original before the first fire. It was begun in 1134. There was a fire in 1194. Um, and the, the relic here at Chart is the virgin's tunic. Um, the blanket she was wearing or the head covering she was wearing when she gave birth uh, to the Savior. Um, so it's held here and it survived the fire. It just made it even more holy and more fancy. So we're going to look down at the bottom portal um, at Chartres Cathedral. You can see the doorway essentially um, uh, because that is original at Chartres and gives an idea of what Saint-Denis uh, would have looked like too. So this is it. This is the portal uh, on the west facade. Um, you can see episodes from Christ's life on the capitals. They kind of leaked um, each door to the next as they told the whole story up on those top capitals. Um, what you see in that central tympanum shouldn't surprise us. There's Christ in judgment at the second coming, surrounded by um, those four symbols of the, the four evangelists, like we've seen before too. Um, and on the left portal, there's an image of Christ ascending into heaven. But the right portal is really interesting to us uh, in the context uh, of Gothic architecture. Um, for a couple of reasons um, that are very, very Gothic, that kind of hit into our three changes that happened at the beginning of this class. Uh, so when the archivolts, so the archivolts are kind of those um, strips that surround the tympanum. Um, the archivolts, the right portal, symbolizes the seven uh, female liberal arts and their male champions. So, so basically, they have um, their curriculum that's in those archivolts. All they summarize all medieval learning at the time, all human knowledge which they believe leads one to God. Um, in fact, you can see one on the right. There's Pythagoras uh, with his heart. Pythagoras. Um, which was a representative of music and then surrounded we see seated scholars at work so the fact that they're emphasizing learning as it leads one to god that feels very aristotelian and falls right in line with the new universities that are being established at the time um, and then inside that tympanum uh, we see christ on mary's lap above reliefs illustrating the infancy of christ so these are all things uh, where Mary is is very important. Um, so on below, you see the divine God being born in the flesh as a man, moving from that manger crib of humble birth all the way up to the divinity recognized by Simeon, Simeon and Hannah at the temple, and then on top, sitting on Mary's lap. All of these things that are going to emphasize Mary's import. So there's our, our third one as well, that we see that rise of Marianism on this whole building that is Notre Dame de Chartres. The whole building itself is dedicated to Chartres, but the relic being this important uh, relic of, of Mary's life. So going back, if you can see down in the Jean statues in the central porter, portal, we're going to look more specifically at these images um, of these Old Testament kings and queens. Um, on the Jean statues... So here we see these royal ancestors of Christ that support or prefigure his arrival. They're dressed in 12th century clothes, not in togas. They're likening the scriptures unto them just a little bit. Now, they stand rigidly. They've got these linear folds in the garments. Um, but looking at them, I think, do I have? I don't have. If we were to compare this to an earlier statue like our Jeremiah or Isaiah, they're definitely standing more naturalistically than in Romanesque art. They're standing on two feet, for example. There's too many folds in those garments, but don't they fall a little more naturalistically than we've seen before? And the proportions are a little off. Um, the queen, for example, looks like she's 11 feet tall. There's some long, long legs. But there's some attention. Um, look at the faces. Don't they, they look like different people not like a stock here's what a person looks like but clearly they're paying a little bit of attention um, to what people look like to the naturalistic world they're clearly using some sort of model instead of just a symbol of of what human looks like and three-dimensional they're carved from a round service not not from a lot flat wall no stock figures to tell the story so a little bit more naturalism than than what we've seen uh, in Romanesque art. 
Um, this is the west facade of Leon Cathedral. This gives us a good idea of what early Gothic looks like on an entire cathedral. So what we can tell Gothic about that big westwork, that huge central rose window. Again, so the light at sunset can filter in through that window and flood the interior with light. Deep porches, open towers. They're doing everything they can um, to to subtract from the solidity of the building. In some ways, it's it's helpful to think of a Gothic cathedral as a giant sculpture, because um, that's what they're doing is they're they're trying to get away the unnecessary carve out space within the building so the whole thing feels light and airy and transparent um, and opening up the solidity of the wall and filling it uh, with this delicate glass reducing as much mass uh, as they can and if we go in Leon Cathedral um, you can see that light that's coming through and, and filling up the building um, it maintains some Romanesque ideas um, but you'll notice that rib vaulting um, those engaged columns on your, right now we're still ABAB um, as we march down that nave. But that rib vaulting that's engaged that shoots all the way from the bottom floor all the way up to the top of the ceiling into those rib vaults. We're really emphasizing the verticality of the building. This is still divided into four different steps, just like Romanesque. But those engaged columns seem to pull you up and that's the idea if I walk into the building my soul is pulled up the light filters down and somewhere in that mess uh, becomes a communication with with divinity um, we have this new idea of the triforium we're gonna break up that continuous wall surface again trying to strip it down to its skeleton uh, to make it appear lighter a more sculptural appearance Um, this is a good one just to kind of show you that idea that they're going to push higher and higher and higher to emphasize that verticality. So I walk in and my soul is pulled up. Now what's interesting is they, they don't have a lot of mathematics to, to understand the weight of these buildings. So in some ways it's guess and check. So you can see Léon. It was built a little bit higher with Notre Dame de Paris to Paris and a little bit higher. Chart is just a little higher. And then you see Amiens. Amiens is as high as the buildings were ever successfully built at this moment. We have some examples, Beauvais, for example, uh, where they try to build even bigger than here at Amiens. They'd build for 40 years and building that tower, and then all of a sudden it would come crashing to the ground because they, they outstripped their abilities. Uh, and then sometimes they'd give up. And so Amiens is the, the tallest successfully completed uh, Gothic cathedral. But you can see them trying to get higher and higher and higher as they're pulling their soul up, pushing you up high as the light filters down. Um, I have some numbers here. Amiens, tallest complete cathedral at 139 feet high. Um, the concurrently built Beauvais was 157.5 feet high, but again, it collapsed twice. Uh, and, and so the project was abandoned. This is Notre Dame de Paris. Uh, and I'm recording this in, uh, what am I recording this? It is June, almost June of 2019. Um, we just had a fire at Notre Dame, which breaks my heart. Um, and so some of this, that, um, that tower, for example, doesn't remain. Uh, and that roof line, they're trying to figure out how to rebuild. Um, although uh, that tower was added on, I believe, in the 19th century, um, after, after they start rebuilding after uh, the French Revolution. Um, so it wasn't quite original to the 12th century, um, but still just heartbreaking. But amazing that a lot of the stained glass and, and much of the structure remains. Um, so here, so here uh, this is one of the largest and highest of the early Gothic cathedrals. Paris becomes a major city uh, at this time. Uh, Louis VI is going to move his official residence to Paris. Um, so this was a big... Sorry, this was a big cathedral at the time. Um, and what was uh, amazing, what they did here, 
is they had to invent some new technology on the fly. Um, it was large, and as the roof started collapsing, they had to figure out how to support um, the building. And so they invent uh, what you can see around. In fact, this you can see them right here. Oh, I can move my little arrow. Hopefully you can see that. These are called flying buttresses. Um, and what happens is when you have a pointed arch, the thrust is going to go outside and push outwards. If you have a Roman arch, the whole thing supports itself. But when we point those arches, the weight comes down and it moves out for the end of the point till it goes down. And so that's what the flying buttress is. We could just make thicker walls, but we don't want to. We're trying to get rid of the solidity. So those buttresses point out and receive that thrust that's moving out down the roof um, and pushing it here and, and flying away from the wall uh, and move down. So that's what these buttresses are. All of these flying buttresses is to receive that weight of the roof. Invented right here at this very building. Um, and um, because of those, uh, subsequent buildings are able to go a little bit higher as well. Um, if we go inside, oh, that's Shark Cathedral, sorry. They use uh, six part type vaults uh, to cover the nave. It is four stories like Leon. Um, just the Triforium was filled with windows. Well, actually, let's go slide above. You can kind of see that in Paris. And fill this with windows over here. Um, doing their best to carve away at that wall, chip away at that wall, and flood that interior with Lux Nova. Um, this is the front of the building. Again, you can see that, that rose window uh, there at the front. Um, early Gothic has fairly, fairly shallow portals here. From what we've seen, it's kind of this geometric design becomes a lovely part of it. Uh, one thing to bring up that we haven't seen yet, because um, you can see these are pretty white, pretty gorgeous. Um, it's funny, when we think of Gothic cathedrals, we think of them these kind of dark, imposing buildings. They weren't dark or imposing at all. Uh, they were built in this really white stone. Uh, so when they built, they just gleamed like the city on the hill. But they're all at the center of cities. Um, and so all sorts of pollution has been thrown up on those buildings um, since they were built. And so they are constantly being cleaned. We'll look at one slide a little bit later um, where you can see um, the scaffolding in place where they're just scrubbing those buildings again. Um, in fact, when Neo-Gothic, when Gothic's become, Gothic architecture becomes all the rage in the 19th century and is built in America, they built it out of these dark, dark stones, um, but not realizing that the original was this brilliant white. This is Chartres Cathedral after the fire. Uh, was rebuilt uh, when that fire happens only the west facade and the crypt which housed the relic uh, were left standing and so the crypt kind of determined the dimensions of the cathedral but other than that we see a shift to high gothic right on this building high gothic vaulting which you can see um, here instead of having a sex bar type vault reaching up what they do is they make really skinny bays so instead of having X's, you know, equilateral X's, we have these long skinny X's. Um, by pushing them together, they get more vaulting per square inch, essentially. Um, but they can really make them steep. And then we have these engaged columns that pull us all the way up to the top. And we can get this really high uh, image up, up to the top. Fewer parts that brace more easily. Notice they've abandoned that alternate support system. They make them all look the same. So instead of having a pattern that's emphasizing its horizontality, they have the engaged columns in that rectangular base system, those skinny base, emphasizing the verticality, pulling the soul up high. This is actually the first church plan from the beginning with, with flying buttresses in place. And notice that Lux Nova on the walls. You can see that light coming through that stained glass and see that reflection on there. Yeah, just beautiful. Um, to see some of the examples uh, here in Chartres, uh, this is Notre Dame de la Belle Verrière, Our Lady of the Beautiful Window. 
um, you can see that virgin and child. Um, just like they're cleaning the outside of the building, they're also cleaning the inside of the building. Um, so his skin isn't actually darker. The glass is just more dirty. If you've ever been inside the Catholic cathedral, candles are a really important part of their worship. And candles let off a lot of, call it lamp black, that, that kind of stain the windows. Um, and so, so it's continuously being cleaned as well. But here it's interesting when we see Christ at this time period in Gothic architecture, Christ is usually as a baby because he's sitting on the lap of his young, beautiful, haloed, crowned mother. Um, that she becomes the emphasis in this story. And that's how we know that we're firmly in the Gothic time period. Here we are in Chartres as well. Um, you can see this rose window, all the intricate details of it, and the lancet windows uh, down below. Um, windows like this were really expensive endeavors, and you can read that class society in the windows. This window was donated by the Queen of France. Um, lesser nobles and members of the clergy donated funds for many of the, the lancets, these tall windows um, at the bottom. And then the rising working class, so like the guilds of bakers, wheelwrights, weavers, furriers, goldsmiths, carpenters. They provided the rest of the windows. Um, and they left signatures, little miniature pictures of themselves. Um, and so it was a big community endeavor. Everybody worked together and donated uh, to these buildings um, and created them. Um, in this we see the virgin and child right there at the center. Shouldn't surprise us, especially given the last slide we talked about. And then the 12 square panels around surrounding it, oh, excuse me, contain um, images of Old Testament kings, who they're applying these ancestors of Christ. And below in these lancet windows, we've got images of various kings, uh, including Melchizedek and David. Solomon uh, and Aaron. So there's um, these Old Testament kings. So we're implying the ancestry of Christ that goes backwards, um, implying the royal ancestry in charge of France. That's uh, an assumption that's coming forward from Christ. That they're just part of this long line of, of royal authority. I want to talk a little bit about this character. Um, this is Saint Anne. So St. Anne is Mary's mother. There's St. Anne with baby Mary on her lap. Um, she becomes important at this moment uh, because Mary has just been deified, kind of quasi-deified. She's become the fourth member of that trinity, of that godhead. Um, and so in order to be deified, uh, it's important that she came into this world without any funny business happening, right? Christ is born by immaculate conception. But here, Mary is also um, godlike, and so she also needs to come in this world by immaculate conception. So the story of her mother is increasingly important. And she indeed was. Saint Anne conceives and bears Mary without any funny business getting her into this world. So there's Mary and um, Saint Anne. Just to show you a couple of other just gorgeous, gorgeous windows. You can see all the very intricate work that goes into them. And also, especially on the left, there's the story of the Good Samaritan. Uh, how they're going to maximize every space in order to tell the stories of the Bible. Same way that in Romanesque, they used the whole exterior um, to communicate that story. Now we're going to use this new space available to us in stained glass uh, to tell more stories of the Bible. So still in Chartres, only now we're moved a little bit later. So this is the same building. On the right, we've got the Old Testament Kings and Queens early Gothic. And now we're moving into the next century in St. Martin, Jerome, and Gregory. So if we compare these two, you can see they're a little bit different. Still three-dimensional. In fact, these guys, they're jumping right out of those columns, aren't they? Um, so very, very three-dimensional. And just like we had a, a paying attention to individuality on the right, we're going to see more individual-looking faces on the left. 
Um, but it's clear they're observing nature even more, right? Doesn't it look more like they're paying attention to what people look like? For one thing, the proportions of those guys make sense. Um, those legs aren't 11 feet long, but they, they seem to fit. Um, and they're not standing quite so stiffly and awkwardly, but they seem to turn uh, within their own space. And drapery, drapery is always a dead giveaway. Uh, on the right, it's starting to obey laws of gravity, but still way too many folds. But on the left, those folds are starting to make sense. Um, note they're clothed in, in 13th century clothing again. Um, still detailed, but, you know, those thigh swirlies are gone. All figures can be identified. They're carrying the attributes of their identity. So sculpture is shifting, showing that number two change, where we are re-emphasizing the naturalistic world. This is it, guys. This is Amiens. This is the height of the Gothic cathedral. Um, all the innovations that they're going to play with in Gothic art. And you can see, especially looking at that ceiling, that rectangular base system, ribbed vaulting, buttressing that allows for an entirely skeletal plan. Walls after this really hold no functional purpose, which is essentially the same thing we do today. We build with iron rebar or steel rebar. Fill it in with a skin of concrete, but the concrete's not supporting the building. It's the rebar. That's essentially what Gothic architecture is. They've stripped it down um, to its skeleton, filled it in with walls of glass um, that, that aren't really supporting anything. Slender piers. As we saw, it got higher with each step. Paris Leon, 78 feet high. Chartres is 118. Reims is 123. Amiens is, is 139. Um, so Amiens is, is about twice as high as Notre-Dame de Paris. Um, really, really high. This dramatic sense of verticality. You walk in that door and your soul gets pulled up to the ceiling. Um, but it's partly an illusion. They make it skinnier too. Um, so in Paris, the, the width to height is 1 to 2. Uh, in Amiens, it's 1 to 3. Um, so they've made the width smaller so it fills taller in on you as it pulls that, that soul up. And it is filled with light. Not just any kind of light, but Lux Nova, new light. Um, we get it just like in Hagia Sophia, this image of Jesus Christ pouring into the building. This is the west facade of Amiens carved out those walls. Um, everything that does remain uh, is, is covered. They've dissolved the solidity of the building. Weightless is a visual image of hell, heaven. Uh, there we see an Amiens. Maybe the ultimate and high Gothic facade is, this is my favorite, is Reims. Doesn't the whole thing just feel stretched? Even that front door and the, is, is just pulled up. And there's that scaffolding I was talking about. This is in the middle of being cleaned. Deep carving, stretched for height. And maybe as the ultimate, we have that giant rose window in the center. But now even the tympanum has been turned over um, to stained glass. Um, so that we can fill uh, that, that light as it pours into the building. My favorite sculpture is around the corner. One of my very favorite works of art. Uh, this is the visitation on Reims. Um, well, one, let's just look at it. We've moved beyond the architecture, right? They've jumped all the way off the side of that building. They're not stuck in that column. Um, but this, the story itself is, is so gothic. For one thing, this is the moment when Mary comes to her cousin Elizabeth to tell her that she's pregnant. But she doesn't even have to tell her. Do you remember why? Because Elizabeth is also pregnant. And when Mary comes up, baby John inside her belly leaps to life. Um, recognizes the baby in Mary's belly. Now this is the most feminine story uh, that I can cut, think of in all of scripture. It is about gossiping. Is she pregnant? Are you pregnant? Um, and how is it confirmed? through the baby moving inside the woman. That is the most feminine moment 
unique to women that I can think of. Everything about this story hinges on, on womanhood. Um, women's intuition, personal revelation, all of it uh, just feels so womanly. And so it's not surprising that here on this cathedral dedicated to Mary, at this time where we are valuing femininity, um, that we're going to see this very feminine story explained. Beyond that, check out those robes. They're straight off the Parthenon, aren't they? Or if they're not, I can see some contraposto. Now it's exaggerated. It's too much of an S, and that knee hits down a little too far, but they're clearly paying attention uh, to how bodies move in a way that they haven't even thought about uh, for a thousand years. And beyond that, age. When's the last time you saw age depicted? Here is old Mary, which is an important part of the story, um, but requires some observation uh, of people surrounding it. Everything about this just screams Gothic. Um, and if you go into the Renaissance in 202 and you say, where does it come from? Why are they making this change? Well, clearly the Renaissance doesn't come out of nowhere. You can see it moving that direction where we're going to preference how things look in the real world. Um, you can see that happening in Gothic architecture. Saint-Chapelle. This is the ultimate in wall dissolving style. Um, essentially, nothing of that wall remains, does it? It is entirely turned over to stained glass. Now, the reason they're able to do that is this is not a complete cathedral. Um, it was built off of a building. Um, it's, it's kind of a private chapel. Uh, for Louis the Ninth, Louis the Ninth was the ultimate king at the ultimate age in medieval France, um, and so he has. This is kind of his apartment had direct access to this chapel, um, and so because it wasn't so building, they're able to turn the entire walls uh, over to stained glass. It becomes this little jewel box. Now, when I say little, right here's human height, and so it's it's still impressively tall. Um, and this little jewel box is an important jewel box. It holds important relics here that Louis the Ninth purchased from his cousin, who was the Emperor of Constantinople at this time. Um, so the relics that were here were the crown of thorns, a piece of iron from the lance that the Roman soldiers shoved into Christ's side, the sponge that they lifted up with vinegar soaked on it, um, and a piece of wood from the true cross. Um, these are these are pretty powerful relics. These are high ticket items, um, which often in class, this is when people finally say, okay, did they really believe they had the crown of thorns here 1200 years later? Um, to which the answer is 100% yes, uh, which you can read in the, in the stories on the walls. Now it's interesting. They have the stained glass. And if you start up here on the left, they move chronologically from Genesis. They start with the creation of Adam, then they're going to move into the story of Noah. They move from Genesis all the way through the books of Kings, the Kings and the Prophets. Um, and once they go through and they've laid out the scripture in a very visual way, they're going to end with a history of the relics stored there. So after it came off Christ's head and Joseph of Arimathea got it, who was the next person to get it? All the way down to Louis the Ninth. So justifying the history of these objects so that you know, you visitor to Saint Chapelle. Um, how important these relics are. This is Virgin and Child, the Virgin of Paris. Here's another great statue with Christ. And you can see that baby Jesus. Again, head's too small, um, but we're moving that direction. Um, but in the arms of his young, beautiful, very queenly looking mother. And she looks very much like a worldly queen. These heavy garments, heavy crown. Um, and that exaggerated S shape that um, is pushed so much that it's it's not a natural way to stand. They're probably more ornamental, more decorative, um, indicating her her position as a as a courtly queen. When we move later, this we're moving into late Gothic, sometimes called flamboyant architecture. Flamboyant uh, means flame like. Um, and that's, that's kind of what this looks like, doesn't it? A little bit like it's on sculptural fire. 
Um, it's a smaller scale building. It's only 180 feet long, 75 feet high. Um, and you can see a little bit the ends became the means, or the means became the end. Um, when we had, we were pulling together, we're carving away at the wall to dissolve it to make it feel lighter. That's kind of the idea of carving away at the wall and and adding this has, has created a tracery and this kind of brittle art, uh, sculptural look that really overwhelms uh, the building. Ornate gables pierce through, making brittle decorative webs. The profusion of that decoration overwhelms the building. Or we've kind of lost our goal of increasing height and dissolving the wall to fill it with the stained glass. Now we're just dissolving the wall and, and, and adding this extra decoration. I just want to give you an idea. This is the fortified town of, of Carcassonne. Clearly it's a time of defense. See that thick moat uh, that surrounds the city. Rampart sometimes enclosed entire towns. You'd have guards circling the town. So Carcassonne gives us a little bit of an idea of that. And you can see it, the fortified castle with a cathedral. Find the cathedral that there's your cross building. Um, castle, town, all of it enclosed uh, within this building. Um, see this book manufacturer book? Um, here's shift a little bit into illuminated manuscripts and see what they feel like in this Gothic era. A book manufacturer shifts from monks meticulously copying out every word of the Bible to urban workshops. Um, and so that's what we see down in the lower register of this. Uh, you can see a monk and is directing someone who's not a monk who's illuminated that manuscript. Up at the top we see Blanche of Castile. Uh, who was the mother of Louis the Ninth? This is your ultimate king, um, and so this is it's dedicated to them. She purchased this book for him, and you can see that shift in the culture um, down below. Louis the Ninth, pictured right here, was an avid book collector. Oh, this one's fascinating. Um, so here we have Abraham and the three angels. We've already talked about this is our favorite story from the Bible, where the three angels come to Abraham and say, hey, we're going to burn up um, Sodom and Gomorrah. And he goes, wait, what if there's 20 good people? He said, nope, not for 20. What if there's five? Gets down to one, and they can't find one good person to burn the city. And again, they love this part of the story because story, they see the three angels as a uh, prefiguration for the Trinity. Um, but what's interesting is you know this is Gothic. We've got that rose window in the background, pointed arches. Um, but even that really heavy dividing in between makes the image itself look a little bit like stained glass. So just as sculpture looked back to manuscript illumination, the holy thing is now light. And so that illumination is going to look to stained glass in creating the art. Often books and stained glass were created in that same workshop, so it's very much not surprising uh, that we see them influencing each other. Uh, figures in kind of that pushed S-curve Rayonant style. Um, and one thing you see that we've seen before, two episodes of the, of the story on the same page here, Abraham's greeting on the left. Um, and entertains them on the right. Uh, David anointed by Saul. You can see David preparing to kill Goliath. David slaying Goliath with the sword. And multiple scenes from that same story within it. We've got a label everyone. So here's Samuel anointing David. Uh, there's King Saul and David dressed like crusaders as they're likening the scriptures unto them. There's Goliath with a stone stuck in his forehead. And then David, who's chopped off his head with his gouge in it, is taking it with him. More sculptural, a little bit. Still two-dimensional, but we've kind of seen this more emphasis on, on what things look like in the naturalistic world and, and moving in that direction. And just show you, I haven't really shown you any of the texts that that would accompany these images. We can see some of that painstaking that the text itself um, becomes an art form. 
this Virgin Jean Devereux is is kind of interesting. The great sculptor with um, with baby Jesus. Again, looking increasingly naturalistic. She's in a very pushed contrapostal sort of shape, that exaggerated S-curve shape. Um, the box she's sitting on would, would be a relic where he could hold um, a relic in it. All right, that is French Gothic. Now, Gothic basically happens in France. In France is where it's at and, and where the story gets told. Um, but French Gothic has influence in other countries. Uh, around the world. And so we're going to leave France behind and move first uh, to England. Salisbury Cathedral looks different. Um, that Parisian Gothic style begins to be exported almost immediately, but is going to differ in style by each culture that adopts it. England develops perhaps the most distinctive of the styles. So if we were in class, I'd ask you what is, is Gothic about it? Um, and the thing to me that's almost most gothic is these flying buttresses here. But just like any other English cathedral, it's kind of short and fat, um, squat. In fact, my favorite part is that facade that's lacking those two towers on the front on the westward. It's short and fat so much so that these are completely pointless uh, flying buttresses. They're not supporting anything. The ceiling and walls can support themselves just fine without reaching for the same height that the French Gothic cathedrals were reaching for. So why are there flying buttresses on them? Because they're so fashionable, right? They're just trying to be as as elegant as the French, and so they're including those, those um, flying buttresses as a superficial prop. Um, one thing that really stands out is this crazy crossing tower, which is impressively huge. It's the dominant feature. In fact, it is 404 feet tall. That is a massive, massive tower. Such that even though it's kind of dressed up with French clothes, nothing about this feels French Gothic. And see the plan? This is the plan. It's got this double crossing arm in it, this long rectilinear plan with a flat end, which is very uniquely English. And if we want to go inside the building, this is what it looks like. Um, again, very different from French Gothic. Uh, it's got the three part elevation of Parisian cathedrals, but kind of a squat gallery. Um, and those pier colonnettes stop at the top of the piers instead of stretching all the way up to the vaulting. So we don't have those engaged columns that emphasize the verticality of the building. In fact, what we have instead, the effect of this kind of multicolored marble almost serves as arrows down the horizontal length of the building, doesn't it? So we're emphasizing that horizontality instead of the verticality that was so important to the French. Gloucester Cathedral. England's always loved decorative elements for decorative sake. Um, not to emphasize any architectural feature. Uh, in fact, just to remind you of Romanesque Durham. Kind of just those chevrons just for funsies, right? It seems very Germanic that way. Um, and so this is going to grow into what we call the decorated style of the 14th century. This is the perpendicular style. Um, which you can almost think it's like the ceiling's perpendicular to whatever we're pointing up. France, we're just going to point up to the ceiling or point up to heaven. But Gloucester Cathedral, because of that profusion of decorative elements at the top, your soul stops right there at the top and, and kind of gets mixed up in that web. Um, and if we're going to push that even further, here we are at Westminster Abbey. Another form of this perpendicular style is that fan vault. Isn't that ceiling incredible? Multiple ribs that look like a giant fan that's, that's opening up. Almost as theatricality, you know, the contemporary style in France right now is that flamboyant style, that kind of profusion of decorative, brittle uh, decoration over the outside of the building. You get a little bit of that feeling uh, with these fan vaults. 
Now, what's interesting in Westminster Abbey, if you've ever been there, we've got all sorts of people buried uh, in Westminster Abbey, um, which was a really common uh, tradition. In late Gothic England, churches commonly contained tombs. So the dying faithful requested masses uh, to be sung in their honor after the church, after their death, and they gave rich bequests to churches. Now, this isn't a bad de- idea if you're a rich uh, person who's a little bit worried that um, you're not going to make it to heaven. If you give a lot of money to the church, then all the monks, these most pious, righteous, faithful monks, are going to spend their long hours praying your soul out of hell or out of purgatory. Um, and so these rich bequests became a nice insurance plan um, for the afterlife. Um, because lots of people are buried there, we can see, for example, in Gloucester Cathedral, here's Edward II. Um, he, incidentally, was murdered. His son pay, pays for this reliquary. Um, and so the king and this, these sculptures on top of the, of the um, sarcophagus um, would be a portrait of the deceased. I like this one. Edward II gets his own little mini perpendicular chapel um, right there within in Gloucester Cathedral. We're going to move to Germany. Germany's going to hang on to the Romanesque style for quite some time because their last big claim to fame were the autos. So French Gothic style will appear in the mid-13th century. Um, and so here's a Gothic building. This one incidentally takes 600 years to complete this building. It's begun in 1248 and finished in 1880 when the Gothic Revival was in full swing. This is the same time that Salt Lake Temple is built. And you can see they're building out a still uh, on the west work of this building. And this is one like Beauvais where they build and build and build and build and then they can't figure it out because it's going to collapse. Um, and so again, it gets rebuilt six, 600 years later. It doesn't look particularly frightening. Again, when they built this, they probably matched that dark, dark still against what they thought was dark, dark stone. You can see they're starting to clean and, and get some of that away. Um, but here's an etching uh, of, of what it would have looked like, or what it did look like for 600 years. If we go inside, uh, this is what we see. Like Amiens a little bit, built about the same time, with really skinny, slender lancet, lancet windows. And with those engaged columns, we see again that quest for verticality um, that was so conspicuously absent in Germany. One of the earliest German variations on French standards is the Hall Church. Um, and all they do here is they raise up the side aisles to the same height as the nave. So no galleries, no triforium, etc. But just and they're going to compose them entirely of windows that flood the interior with light, especially because they've made this great hall, more so than the French Gothic uh, cathedrals. Uh, this is interesting. This is a Strasbourg uh, cathedral. Strasbourg is an interesting place. It is in eastern, northeastern France. It's an area of land that has been traded back and forth between the Germans and the French for centuries. Um, and it feels like that within the city. For example, for dinner in Strasbourg, I had a quiche appetizer and Wiener Stitzel as my main course. Um, it just is this funny blend of the two cultures. Uh, and Strasbourg is essentially, it's built like a Romanesque cathedral, but, but this certainly isn't Romanesque. But it's out of this reddish stone that, that just kind of glows uh, throughout the building, which is beautiful when the sun hits it. But certainly, this is more emotional than any Romanesque image that we've seen. And I like these faces, him just holding his head in his hands. They become kind of these tragic portraits of the character. This is the death of the Virgin. So there is, uh, in the center, Mary, who's laid out. And there's little Mary's soul heading up into heaven. But definitely a lot more sorrow depicted. In fact, Mary Magdalene at her feet, wringing her hands and grimacing. And it's increasingly humanized, increasingly natural. Again, because we're emphasizing the naturalistic world and, and paying attention to how people feel in it. <gasps> this is one of my favorite works of art. 
Isn't it awful? It's horrifying. Um, 14th century. Um, this is a Pieta um, image, which was really, really common. Most famous is Michelangelo's Pieta, but it's certainly not the only Pieta. There's a, the Rocken Pieta, um, which means you're having Mary holding that dead Christ. Mary of empathy holding the dead Christ. So I'm, you guys know, right, why that's such a popular image now? Because that is why Mary rises up so high, because um, we need her compassion and love. And the 14th century, when this is created, is a particular time of needing Mary's compassion. Um, the plague hits Europe. Um, between 20 and 30 million deaths in Europe. The Black Plague is estimated to have killed between one-third and two-thirds of Europe's population. That is a massive, massive amount. Um, beyond that, we have war, we have famine. It's bringing a very real um, and new awareness of suffering to Europe. And so what do we need? Who do we need? We need the Mary who held her dead child in her arms. Um, because that's what people are literally doing, is holding their dead family in arms. Uh, and so we see this evolution from this pretty young mother cradling to this newborn baby, um, to Mary in grief. She is aged, she is worn, she is exhausted with grief. She holds this distorted Christ, um, who is suffering in death with blood streaming out of him who seems more to maybe be suffering with the Black Plague than he is with any crucifixion. Um, and my very favorite part of this piece is a lot of the original paint remains, except in these little spots, because this is where the viewer would have come and touched it, to make that physical, tangible connection uh, with Mary uh, and her empathy and her understanding. Art beginning to address individual emotion. That's huge, and, and that is needed. In the Meuse River Valley, um, it's been long known for its metalwork. Remember that baptismal font uh, that we saw a little bit earlier? The leading artist this time was Nicholas of Verdun, and he created this. It used to be a pulpit for biblical readings. Um, we're going to start to see um, pulpit this new piece of church furniture because we want people to start to understand what's going on in church for addressing that individual. Um, and so the middle row addresses those New Testament scenes. Um, upper and lower rows contain Old Testament scenes. So you can read it from left to right. You can read it from top to bottom. And we don't know if this was Nicholas of Verdun's original organization, but there was a fire again, and this is what was created after. Um, and so things like the sacrifice of Isaac would be paired with Christ's crucifixion. So they could see it as the Old Testament prefiguring the New Testament. Um, and so that's what we see on the right here uh, is Abraham sacrificing Isaac. Doesn't that Isaac, I mean, clearly he's not living a normal life out after that. That is one traumatic <laughs> bound figure. Um, and you see that angel coming and grabbing that sword. Some of this drama of the Gothic age, that angel swooping in at the last moment. A lot more emotion than we certainly would have seen in, in Romanesque art. Um, this is a reliquary. It is huge. It's massive. You can kind of see the dimensions there. 5 feet 8 inches by 6 feet by 3 feet 8 inches. Um, and this was a really, really important reliquary. It contained... Uh, the relics of the three magi. It contained the bones of the of the wise men. Um, and what was really important about this relic is because um, it was held at this cathedral, it gave the archbishops at Cologne, where this was held, the right to crown the German kings. That's a pretty big power play item right there, right? They can essentially pick who's in charge of the country um, based on this relic. Interesting, it resembles this Basilica plan church. You can see that central nave, the two side aisles. Um, and essentially, it's like the figures on it. We're taking these figures, making them 3D. And that's the images that we get. Okay, we're going to head down to Italy with just a couple buildings. Now, um, Italy is an interesting place because of its historic history and geographical location. It's subject to three major cultural influences. 
Um, for one, it's got these classical ruins that are just kicking around. Um, second, the Byzantine Empire is just to the east, and because they extend into the Mediterranean, um, they're going to get a lot of influence trading through the Byzantine Empire. And then finally, you have the French Gothic. Um, now, largely because it's easier to teach, Art History 201 ignores classical and Byzantine influences, um, because all of that's talked about in the next chapter of history, which just happens to be in a totally different class. Uh, as the beginning of the Renaissance. But for people living in the 14th century Italy, things are all happening at the same time. So following our historical tradition, we're going to talk about the impact of the French Gothic and the minimal impact of the French Gothic, because it didn't make a lot of inroads uh, into Italy. Um, see some influence. So if you could point this out. What influence do we see from French Gothic? got a little rose window right there for one um, some pointed gables these facades kind of dividing um, the front into three bays uh, not really the towers in fact the facade is kind of interesting it's this traditional basilican plant church it looks more like the pisa cathedral than it does like Amiens. so more like the italian romanesque than anything going on in the french gothic um, i do want to spend some time down at these piers, if you can see them. So we've got these giant relief panels. Uh, and here's an example. Those pilasters read stories from Genesis, from the tree of Jesse, from the life of Christ, and from the last judgment. Um, you can see, almost like Bishop Bernward's doors, we've got this, this tiers of figures that are unified by these meandering vines throughout the central axis and spout tendrils to frame the scenes. Um, but we see a lot of Gothic pathos, a lot of Gothic emotion, um, especially in hell. Um, and that's what the close-up is on the right. This figure that's dying in the grip of a terrifying monster. Um, now, it's often wondered if certainly Michelangelo would have seen these. Um, and, and I've seen this attributed that perhaps Michelangelo's Pieta would have come out of this. At the very least, that Gothic emotion... Uh, feeling emotion in this world is definitely present in this work. This is the Doge's Palace in Venice. Venice was one of the wealthiest cities of Europe. It had streets of water, still does. Uh, it was a tight corporation of ruling families controlled Venice. Uh, and this is the Republic's seat of government, the Duke's Palace, or in now in Italian, the Doge's Palace. So what about this looks gothic? It's got some pointed arches, um, kind of squat on the first level to support the above levels, um, and then thinner and taller ogival arches above. But you definitely see that Italian love of patterning being much more dominant um, than the Gothic uh, images throughout it. And our last work of art that we will look at for this lecture and for this class is the Milan Cathedral, which kind of serves as a good metaphor for what's going on in Italy at this time. Um, this is what happens with architecture by many. Um, in order to build the Milan Cathedral, they invited experts from France, from Germany, from England, from Italy. They were all hired and fired in quick succession. So this building becomes kind of this interesting compromise from heated arguments. So the proportions are Italian, it's short and fat. That French desire for height and light are almost entirely ignored, except the surface decoration. All that brittle tracery and sculptural decoration is Gothic. Um, but you're going to see Renaissance classicism, where they're valuing um, kind of Greece and Rome again. It takes over with some tympanums. This becomes kind of this hodgepodge of styles, which serves as a wonderful metaphor uh, for Italy in the 14th century.